Presenting the Konica Eyeborg. This time around, we have something really um, different. This has to be one of the funkiest cameras we have ever featured on the show, and one that barely anyone has heard of as well. Ugly, weird, and hard to understand. And that's not just your host. The Konica Eyeborg is a basket case of a camera. So let's have a look at this hot mess. Oh, hey. What's up? Didn't see you there. Like the new t-shirt? Check it out. Come and get some of these new t-shirts. Come and support the site. This is the Shunga t-shirt. It's up now. Buying these really helps us make new videos, so I hope you do. Cheers. Konica released this camera in 1991. They were certainly being ambitious. In fact, they were being, I think, a little bit too over ambitious because they just tried to pack about everything into this camera, including the kitchen sink. Konica generously described it as futuristic, black, ellipsoidal. They probably should have added confusing as once you see the array of buttons on the back, you will probably be as confused as I am. Oh, fuck off. We have spoken before in previous videos about ergonomics, which were the, uh, the buzzword in the 90s, and yet Konica and the iBorg didn't seem to get the memo. This camera manages to be awkward and ugly all at the same time. Double bonus. Just look at it. It's a masterpiece in awkward design. It looks more like Helmet than Vader, but Vader sounds cooler, so that's the nickname that stuck. The iBorg is uh, no lightweight either. Coming in at just over 500 grams, it's, it's pretty chonky, it's a chonky boy. Not only that, it doesn't even fit in the hand well. It, it, the shutter button is not here, it should be here. There's so many buttons on the back, it's, oh, it's so confusing. Just, has anybody got any hand sanitizer? So, am I being overly harsh? No, not really. This camera is really a complete mess, but that doesn't mean it's incapable. The iBorg has a wealth of features, many of which are innovative, though seemingly pointless. When you scroll through the menu at the top of the camera, you can choose the usual stuff. Flash, night mode, portrait mode, etc. But from then on in, things get pretty wild. The functions become a bit, well, different. There's the TV mode for taking photographs of your television, and this was before we had HD TV, so you had to stop interlacing, so they had a special function on the camera to help it do that. Then you had snow mode, so you could take pictures in snowy or very bright places, but then the camera should have already been able to do that. I don't know why that's a mode. One interesting one is the bouncy ball mode, where you can take six uh, shots, multi-exposure in the same frame, and uh, create over a space of seconds a bouncy ball mode, like an old-fashioned GIF, or GIF, whatever. Multiple exposure is a given, but there is also interval exposure mode. This one's pretty cool. You can set the camera to shoot multiple consecutive single exposure shots over a set period of time until the film runs out or the timer runs out, which is unlikely as you can select up to 99 hours between each frame. Yeah, that sounds practical. On the back of the camera, there's a joystick, because back then in the 90s we thought everything would be controlled with a joystick. Cars, planes, video games, and absurdly overcomplicated cameras that look quite silly. This one has a joystick on the back to help you control the focus and the zoom. And um, yes, this joystick does not spark joy at all. The Finder is frankly horrible. It is tiny and a jumble of information and symbols that are really hard to see. The shutter button is in completely the wrong place. I could go on and on and on. There is one thing that Konica did get right on this camera and that's the lens. And Well, Konica generally does get lenses right. It's a compact zoom, 35 to 105 with 
variable f-stop 3.5 to 8.5, 13 elements. It's not bad, it's nice zoom. <laughs> hey, is that a camera in your pocket? Or are you just pleased to see me? Um, but it's bulky, it's, it, yeah, it's, do I really have to go and shoot with this thing? Yes, you do. Uh, uh, fine, okay, let's get it over with then. and then leave or okay yeah okay ready Konica spent the best part of the 1990s trying to create the ultimate compact camera which they certainly didn't do with this one, and this was one of their final attempts. Now back then, everything seemed to be needed to be futuristic and modern and super cool and with everything, all the bells and whistles, which this one certainly did do. It looks like somebody in the design department watched Star Wars, then watched a bit of Spaceballs, drank a few too many chew highs, got on the old drawing board, and this was the result. The Konica iBorg, somewhat unsurprisingly, was a commercial failure. I wonder why. Basically, it had too much going on. They say that beauty comes from within, but within here, there's way too much stuff. It's like the janitor in the meeting, design meeting, got to have, everybody got to have a go at putting something on this camera. It's a bit of a mess. The result, a weird looking camera with some really quirky features, great lens, but more daft than darth. A um, little bit too much going on in this one, I'm afraid. Would I put this into the regular rotation in my bag? No, I don't have time for that. I don't think anybody has time for that. But I do want to have a go on some of those weird features. They look kind of fun. So, it's that time you love. Pros and cons time. Well, pros, they're cheap. Cons, they're cheap for a reason. Yeah. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, make sure you check out the uh, website, japancamerahunter.com. Thanks so much, and as always, keep shooting film.